Our case study, our reading, is an account of the dispute in General Motors over the development and construction, building, um, uh, production of a copper-cooled engine. Uh, the uh, material that we're using is an article by Stuart Leslie called Charles F. Kettering, The Copper-Cooled Engine, and Design and Manufacturing at General Motors. Now, in order to understand what's going on in this account, we have to first understand the something of the context in which General Motors was living. The time period is the late teens uh, in the 20th century, at, at the end of World War I, moving in towards the 20s. General Motors was in trouble. General Motors had been blown away by Ford, uh, by Henry Ford, and the introduction of the Model T. Uh, as you may know, when you think about Henry Ford, most likely with, Hen with the name Henry Ford, you identify the term mass production. Henry Ford had formulated a method and put in practice a method for, for um, achieving a 20th century version of the American approach to manufacturing, namely low cost, mass use. The Model T was indeed a, a, a well-designed, well-constructed vehicle that was um, a, with a fairly low cost and fairly widespread uh, uh, sales. Now, Henry Ford also uh, is uh, what we associate with Henry Ford is a, is a concept called Fordism, which involves not only the mass production in order to, to um, make, and make it possible for goods to get into the hands of workers, but also he made a case for uh, increasing wages of workers so that workers would have the ability to purchase the, the goods being developed by this new um, uh, new uh, expansion of industry in the United States. Uh, so in addition to the label mass production, you probably also know Henry Ford for the label uh, $5 a day. Now, General Motors, how is this company organized? It's important to understand that the, that the idea of a corporate structure is not something that's been around forever. And indeed, at a later point, we'll, we will be exploring the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, um, the realization and evolution of, a, of the corporate structure. What we had here, which, which developed in the late 19th century, General Motors uh, was a corporate structure. In order to understand the, 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 uh, the tension that developed between design and manufacturing, it's important to understand how design gets located in the corporate structure of General Motors. Well, as you hopefully can tell from the reading, um, General Motors was at the time divided into divisions, with each division producing a different sort of vehicle. The, uh, the, the ones that uh, Leslie describes in his book include Chevrolet, Oldsmobile, Cadillac, and Oakland. Now, in these divisions, who built the cars? Who designed the cars? Was there a distinction between those who designed and those who built? We have to infer this from the reading, but in fact, it's the manufacturing engineers, the people working in production, people who got their hands dirty, who also um, were involved in new design work. So the, 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 the activity of design and the activity of, of manufacturing were located in the same sets of hands. And there's a, a fairly close relationship between the engineers and workers on the machinery. Um, uh, General Motors uh, was beginning to develop what became known as a bureaucratic organizational structure, where a bureaucracy is basically defined as a, as a functional structure, which is to say that different parts of the organization perform different functions for the corporation as a whole. And so, for example, you might have what we talk about today as finance or production, or maybe today management systems um, and, and personnel. Different, uh, different structures live inside the corporation and provide functions to the whole. So this corporation was beginning to pull out some of those functions, but for the most part, it was or still organized according to these divisions. GM was having difficulty. And by 1920, 
it was necessary to, to, um, to take some new steps to reorganize. Uh, they did so by instituting a new president by the name of Pierre Dupont. He became president and he introduced a new corporate model for these divisions, which is to say that the different divisions would aim for different markets. The idea was to have the Chevrolet be a high volume, low priced vehicle, and the Cadillac on the other end being a low volume, high priced vehicle. The idea was to sort out the market in, 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 in ways that would appeal to different uh, people with different levels of income in different ways. This was in sharp contrast with the Ford strategy that, that treated the masses as a whole. Now, as you may know, in the end, the GM strategy works brilliantly. And by the time we get to World War II, it's very easy to argue, and people said regularly, that what's good for GM is good for America because GM had grown to such a size and indeed pioneered this new strategy that we live today in spades as manufacturers compete to draw finer and finer distinctions in the marketplace. Now, how does GM go about improving its position relative to Ford? Well, um, prior to 1920, back in 1916, then president of General Motors, William Durant, purchased this company called the Dayton Engineering Laboratories Company. Dayton Engineering Laboratories Company, D-E-L-C-O. Yes, this is the origin of Delco. From this guy by the name of Charles Kettering, it was purchased in 1916 for $9 million in cash and stock. Nine million dollars in cash and stock in 1916. Now, uh, and, 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 and in order to bring this engineering laboratories company, these names are important, these labels are important. The label laboratory is crucially important for our story here. Now, this guy, Charles Kettering, had been a successful inventor, and again, notice the term, inventor, inside of a company called National Cash Register. And in order to take advantage of a, of a, of a new invention that he developed, a, uh, a battery ignition system, he founded this new company, Delco, Dayton Electri Ele Engineering Laboratories Company, in 1909 uh, to exploit this invention. And indeed, it worked well. He developed a self-starter unit, the first self-starter unit, that, uh, and then sold it to, to General Motors in 1912 for the Cadillac. So this new company, Delco, and its leader, um, Charles Kettering, was establishing a relationship with General Motors, a productive relationship. And from the point of view of GM, Durant, and the others and the, in the leadership, this new company was a source of new ideas. This was a source of light bulbs. Now, it's important for you to understand that after World War I, uh, across the populace in general, science had gained a new uh, a, a status that was uh, unprecedented in the United States. The development of, of some new technologies during World War I had led people to realize, hey, science can be a, uh, a, a source of, of, te of, of technological progress and hence economic progress of all sorts. And so, um, indeed, after World War I, uh, a, a poll was taken, taken by a private polling agency uh, asking Americans who was the most important American in the history of the country, the single most important person. And the answer was not George Washington. And the answer was not Abraham Lincoln. The answer was Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison literally associated with the lighting light bulb, both for people and up, up above them as images. In other words, Thomas Edison was the, the important icon of invention in the United States. And science became associated with the possibility of improved inventions. So GM, in its, in its uh, 
uh, strategies and formulating strategies to deal with Ford decides to turn to science and purchases, uh, and purchases Delco, brings it into the company. Now, where it's located is going to become important. In, in arriving at in the, in the company, um, Kettering wants to put into practice a new idea that he's been carrying uh, for some time. He read an article in 1915. After a couple of years in the company in 1919, he tries to put it into practice. And that is the development of an air-cooled engine. Others had worked on this, but it seemed particularly appropriate in the late teens, right into the early 20s. Uh, 